Time for another NZ Aviation podcast. And given that everybody's locked down and uh, video conferencing and all of that, we thought we'd try the Zoom application and put our faces on this edition. Um, I'm Paul Brennan. Hey, Martin. Sitting here in my little studio in Auckland. And Martin, you look like you're living the Aussie dream. You've got the Aussie bush behind you. You're wearing the hat. It's a big sky. It's blue. It looks sunny. What is it, 45 degrees or something? No, nah, not going to get that hot today. Get into the 30s. Um, I wouldn't say dream. I'm kind of marooned here. Got stuck on the way back from Europe. Um, was heading for New Zealand. And by the time I'd actually made up my mind to make the jump over the Tasman, it was all shut down. And so I ended up having to take a what I thought was a short-term job here out in Roma. Um, I could be out here for a few months, I suspect. But nonetheless, it is um, the quintessential Aussie environment, isn't it? I mean, um, not only uh, do we have the background, but aren't you near the sale yards? I'm right opposite the cattle yards, yeah, biggest cattle market in the Southern Hemisphere. And oh, I'm, running okay. a ware- I'm running a warehouse that sells cattle feed and, and all that type of thing. And I'm, I guess I'm quite lucky because I had a, a, a car here which I'd actually was, I stopped over in Australia to sell the, the ute, the classic Crayback ute. And um, so when I got offered this job, I just loaded up the ute with the stuff I already had here and drove out to Roma. And that's where I've been um, for the last month, six weeks. Mm. There's a place for everyone, Martin. There is. And unfortunately, it looks, it's looking like mine's Roma, which is not what I had in mind. But hey, there yeah. you go. You imagine someone uh, uh, telling your fortune a few years ago, and you'll end up in this remote uh, Queensland town, marooned uh, due to a pandemic of a panic-inducing coronavirus. Would you have believed it at the time? No, no, no. Uh, and I mean, there's probably worse places to be marooned. I'm, it, it, I'm, I'm not not enjoying it. It's just um, I'm a bit puzzled most mornings when I wake up. You know, what the hell am I doing here? But yeah, here I am. Now, if I see any um, rampaging kangaroos behind you, running towards you, I'll let you know. No, they've all been shot. There's no danger of that. Um, kangaroo hunting's a big deal here. Oh, really? It's like hunting yeah. the kiwi. Yeah, no, they, they, they're all over dead kangaroos. Um, you'll see utes driving down the road with um, racks in the back of um, decapitated kangaroos hanging oh. upside down on their way to the local butchery. And um, when I first got here, I was puzzled by the sight of mainly land cruisers with sort of padded bars curving around the windscreen and along the side windows. And that, that, that's there so you can um, sit in the comfort of your ute with a big um, spotlight that you control from the ah, roof, the yep. spotlight on the roof. And you sit in your car and you lean your rifle against these padded bars and you shoot them at night and then you gather them up as quickly as you can and take them to the, uh, take them to the local butchery. And uh, I, I subsequently, I spoke to a guy who... who who had been a kangaroo hunter, and he says it's pretty good. It's pretty good money. It's it's at the moment it's sixty five, seventy dollars a carcass. Um, so you shoot them for four or five hours, and you've got to get them to the to the butchery, the processing, the meat processor, within a certain number of hours. And yeah, sixty five, seventy dollars a carcass. And he was saying when he stopped about eighteen months ago, the biggest purchaser was the uh, Chinese military. They were. They were basically buying up as much kangaroo meat as, as, as they could get. Boy, they're everywhere, aren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a low-fat, high-protein meat and um, you know, pretty good for feeding soldiers by all accounts. Yeah, um, it's funny. You, uh, you know, one moment, uh, there it is um, uh, on the tail of, you know, A380s uh, taxiing along um, the LAX taxiways, looking proud for Australia. But the truth is... In the real world, they're all getting, you know, blasted away and sent off to China for what the People's Liberation Army to eat and to march on. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time in Switzerland, and 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 kangaroo meat's quite popular in Switzerland too. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm. All right. It's well, not, I didn't, it's, re- it's I didn't realize virtual. I learned all that by making that comment. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, we, uh, I suppose we should get on to the uh, aviation. Uh, well, they used to fly the meat. They probably used to, used to fly it in the hold of um, China Southern Airlines or something like that. Yeah, uh, or Qantas would be ironic. Eh? Or Qantas, yeah. Um, yeah. So the big story today, the day of this recording, using the Zoom application, which I think is fantastic. Everybody's doing that right now. We're bringing the visual element uh, to our podcast. Though years ago, we used to have a video version. It just didn't feature us 
actually um, on camera. But the big story today is Virgin Australia going into administration. It's being reported, but I think that's equivalent to our idea of receivership, same thing. Uh, it's voluntary. Um, they were asking for almost, what, about a billion Australian dollars from someone to uh, help them stay um, uh, flying and operating, though there's no flying to be done to, to stay in existence, I guess to hibernate. So what, is it all over, Rover, you think, for Virgin Australia? There apparently are some um, investors interested in, and one of the conditions that both apparently put out there was that the company enter voluntary administration. They did not want to buy a going concern, which sort of says to me that um, they want to significantly restructure. And, you know, we've always said for a long time now that it needed restructuring. It was never going to succeed as a Qantas clone. Um, it will. It is now in voluntary administration. Um, offers will be received, I expect, and a very different airline should result. Um, if no offers are, the, the, the federal government has been quite clear that they don't, they're not going to prop it up. So if there's no offers forthcoming, that'll be the end of it. Um, the federal government seems quite confident that um, the lack of competition um, short term won't cause any problems. They think that um, if there's no second airline, the international carriers will step up and bring competition to Qantas. It's not impossible that a local company um, tries to get it together. Unfortunately, the rumor is that both suitors, potential suitors, are um, Chinese-based airlines, which um, might cause a bit of an issue. Um, public opinion won't, won't be great for that. They, 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 there'll be a lot of questions asked about that. And, um, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, I don't think a, um, I think they might be entertaining the possibility of a Chinese airline purchasing Virgin at the moment, but I think once they put that out there, there'll be a lot of um, protest. Uh, yeah, not reason. surprising. I think yeah, the two airlines that have been talked about that I've seen, uh, H&L, the Hainan or Hainan Group, and yeah. uh, China Southern, and yeah. uh, you know, the, they have the same owner, which is what the Communist Party of China in the end. Um, I don't think the uh, public at this time, given everything that's going on, would uh, uh, would support an airline with the no uh, in the knowledge that it's it's owned by either one of those two companies. And also um, it uh, it might be that they can satisfy a competition watchdog that they're not going to predatory price or um, artificially destabilize the domestic market in Australia, but they could s sure make it very cheap for Australians to um, access their wider global networks. And that could put Qantas under pressure. So, um, so it looks like their days, unless they get a local, um, what mining magnate billionaire who wants to have a punt at a way reduced scale it's probably done for isn't it and if 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 there is such a mining magnet out there once has a crack at it it's definitely going to be a western australian and it'll be called western star or western australian airlines or something like that and it'll be a probably a train wreck but it'll be quite fun to watch it happen well, what's the old saying if you want to become a millionaire in the aviation business start off a billionaire yeah yeah. Um, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Okay, so uh, there has there been emotional reaction to this? I imagine, what, 16,000 or so staff. That's a huge lot 16, of people. 000. And uh, th this must be a terrible shock for them. They must, the have, radio, known, they must have known it was sort of coming, I'm sure. Well, I think everyone knew it was coming, you know? It is, it is, it's, it's, been, it's been sort of a long goodbye from, from Virgin. They've, they've never really cracked it, so... Yes, but the staff are very emotional. There's a lot of tearful um, sort of tearful demands almost or requests for the Australian public and the government to step in to help safeguard their jobs, which is the only meaningful job they've ever had and <laughs> this, that and the other. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it is going to be unlike when ANSAT went down when the, the Commonwealth government slapped a levy on all airfares sold in Australia to help finance the, um, the workforce. And they, even Air New Zealand kicked in $150 million, which I found surprising. But yes. And they were probably um, think, broke at the time as well. So there you go. Yes, they, they probably were broke. So uh, it, it's, it's an interesting move. Um, I think it's the right move. And I don't think Virgin was ever that viable. I mean, they've never made any money. So you've got to ask yourself, and, and I hope this is, these are some of the sorts of questions that start getting asked going forward. If you've got a publicly traded company which has never made money, which doesn't have to prove that it's got reserves to cover more than, I don't know, five days worth of business. Aren't they technically insolvent? 
Isn't that yeah, you're trading while insolvent. It's a house of cards. Um, yes, and a lot of these businesses have proven to be essentially insolvent. You know, two weeks of bad, two weeks of no business, and they've all collapsed. Um, also, Virgin has a big debt, I believe, in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, what sort of assets do they have if they are wound up to cover that? I think most of their fleet is leased, isn't it? Yeah, they, they have essentially no assets. I mean, you could argue that the gates that they own at the airports might be an asset because they had to pay top dollar to get them from the airport airport slash shopping centers that they that they fly to. Yeah. Um, and, and there's going to be no demand for those gates. So the, no, I, I don't know what assets they have. Um, nothing. Nothing. Again, wow. you know, aren't they technically insolvent? I don't know. Um, I, I suspect they were. They've never made money. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, you it can tell, you know, the, that federal government uh, response was like, okay, no, sorry, see you later. It was kind of under the bus. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've said this before on, 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 on this, that um, attempting, to, attempting to slavishly copy Qantas to try and become Qantas B was never going to work. And, and, and it hasn't and it won't. So whatever comes out of it is going to be a very different, very different and, 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 and potentially more successful airline. But it's sure, surely, a, though, the only thing you can compete on in this situation is the original model that um, Virgin Australia was set up on, and that is the plucky, you know, um, pair it back to the bone, low cost carriers. Um, sort of uh, perception and, you know, the staff, you know, um, being, um, you know, you know how that sort of culture was, you know, it was sort of fizzy and bubbly and, and everything was fun and it was as, as cheap as chips because Qantas have this huge advantage of, first of all, legacy, but Jetstar as well. They're, they're, they're having their cake and they're eating it too. And you'd be reluctant if you were a an upstart um, trying to, you know, fill the uh, vacuum and, and uh, make uh, money where the muck is, uh, to be going up against that, you'd want to know that the competition regulator, um, the Commerce Commission or the AAA or whatever they call it, it is going to be watching it like a hawk. And I don't know if you can really trust that. I don't know. No, no, you, you, you've, got, you've got that. You've also got the fact that um, Qantas had the massive advantage with their, their corporate and government um, connections. Yeah. So, you know, most of the people paying full fare on Qantas were using their um, corporate sponsored gold cards. So, so and, and, and Virgin never really got the corporate buy that, 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 that they were hoping Well, that was for. one of their mistakes, right? Of Borghetti. He tried to um, replicate that uh, in mm. another airline and just couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it, no. And um, also, Virgin never really joined an alliance. So, you know, your, your, um, Qantas, your, your points are actually useful. You could spend some of them on, on Emirates. You could use them on the whole One World Network, whereas um, Virgin had this sort of hodgepodge. Of, you know, they're a little bit connected to Delta. They're a little bit connected to these people, to those people. It, was, it wasn't really a compelling offer. And I, I used to fly Virgin a reasonable amount because of the, you know, I, I had the um, business, not the business sponsored, but because I did a lot of business travel, I had a, I had a um, Air New Zealand um, Gold Elite card. And so I used to fly Virgin, but every now and again, the company, uh, the companies I'd be working for, they'd put me on a Qantas flight. And to be honest, Qantas was better. It was just better. Yeah. Well, I used to always fly Qantas up to the States when I was doing the air shows. I always found them to be more competitive than Air New Zealand. We'll get on to Air New Zealand perhaps because, um, uh, again, if, if anyone had said uh, a while back that, hey, um, in a few months, Air New Zealand's entire 777 fleet will be grounded, the cabin crew or the flight crew, um, and I guess all the support that goes with it is basically going to be laid off, and we're probably not going to have them back in the air for, I don't know, um, six months or a year. I would have spat my coffee out that I was just drinking and said, come yeah. on. But that's exactly the situation uh, right now. Um, so let's get on to the uh, NZ situation. Maybe there's even an opportunity with Virgin um, Pacific, uh, Virgin Australia going down the tubes, let's say, for Air New Zealand to modestly come in there and launch something, not make too much of a fuss that it's from New Zealand and, you know, really sort of uh, make it appealing to do that. Because they've got, uh, not only have they got 777s lying around, they've got, I think, about 30 or almost um, 30 A320 and A321s on the ground. Uh, so... Yeah, I wonder how long this is 
uh, going to go for uh, Air New Zealand. Maybe they'll just even standardise on one long-range aircraft type now. Yeah, so so I don't think Air New Zealand will do anything in Australia because they're they're a little bit too cosy with Qantas at the moment with all those co-chairing agreements and all that stuff. Thing. So I think that Qantas has successfully stifled any ambition Air New Zealand may may not have had in, in that area. I think the the effective grounding of the triple sevens is is um, probably bringing up a few interesting um, opportunities for us uh, for New, Air New Zealand in terms of perhaps getting rid of the triple sevens. So if we're not going to fly them till April, let's try and get rid of them. Although it's a it's, it's you can get rid of the least ones, you can send them back, and it might even be worth paying just paying out whatever it costs to get rid of them. But Air New Zealand might might be looking at um, saying, okay, we will standardise on on a, a, a fleet of primarily A321 NEO and some A320 NEOs for domestic. They have a range of A321 NEOs from the standard version for internal use to the extra, extra LLR long range, whatever they call it, the ultra long range version. And the 787 and its various guys is the 787-9 and the 787-10 because um, you know, Air New Zealand could service just about everywhere with those with those two aircraft types, yeah, and that's that would be that would be very interesting. It save them a lot of money. Um, they could do Perth um, with A three twenty one Neo, the longer range versions. They could do thin, long, thin routes in in the Pacific and um, Southeast Asia with that plane. And for the high density routes, they could run their um, seven eight seven nines and tens. Um, it, it's actually a big opportunity for them. They could go down to t- essentially two aircraft types as opposed yeah. to the three, four right now. Isn't it amazing um, seeing those um, you know, passenger jets having cargo strapped into the passenger seats? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. if you told me that was going to happen, I would have I would have looked at you funny. Yeah. No, I think I think in New Zealand, you know, they are signalling that they're going to come out of this a significantly smaller airline. Um, that would give them, I think, a lot of flexibility. Seven eight sevens, A three twenties, and of course they have their little regional network, but that, they're essentially farmed out to subsidiaries. Um, that would put them in probably a, a, a pretty good space. And and the way Boeing's going, they can probably pick up, you know, seven eight sevens for next to nothing at the moment. Um, Boeing is in a Boeing is in a bad way for exactly the same reason many of these big corporations in the world are in a bad way. They concentrated more on their share price than they did upon their product. And that's yeah, I want, to, I want to touch on that with the U.S. legacy carriers and the, the bailout money that's been made available by the U.S. federal government for the legacy carriers. Just staying in New Zealand, um, the last few days there's been coverage of uh, Air Nelson, uh, sorry, Sounds Air, uh, and also uh, Air Chathams and, and their uh, viability in the situation. It looks like uh, Air Chathams has got itself um, a free flight a week to the Chathams deal with the government, you know, connecting Chathams still. And, and there's that high value seafood exporting that goes on out of there. And I've been over there and observed that. And I'll tell you what, they need that lifeline. And that Convair has been just such a, a great aircraft for um, the Chatham Islands over a long period of time. But, you know, Sounds Air, they've done it all themselves. They've built up a very good reputation over a long period of time operating, you know, Cessna caravans and our favourite, one of our, your favourite, but a favourite of mine too, the PC-12. They've um, made routes that were long abandoned, um, you know, viable. I think Wellington to the West Coast was one of them up to Tampa, those sorts of places. They There was nothing they could do in this situation, um, if the government was going to do what it did, they would take a hit. Surely, an operator like that deserves to be, um, I don't know, compensated somewhere along the line because you need to have those um, remote community connections by air as well. And the big carrier, they ab- well, Air New Zealand, they abandoned those uh, services a long time ago. I kind of feel that uh, there is a role in certain circumstances, uh, given that these actions have been taken by the government at very short notice um, to prevent a, a company like that going under, because it's so hard to reconstitute it. If it's, if it's in hibernation, you can sort of bring it back. 
but if it's yeah. if it's blown to pieces, it never comes back, and it takes years before it can be replaced. And it takes a special set of people to put that sort of thing back together again, and maybe they'll, they're still out there. There's an argument for that. But I would be okay with some sort of compensation being applied to that. And it may turn out that they will, but at the moment, the boss of the place is saying it's basically receivership, here we come. Yeah, which is unfortunate and, and, and possibly a little bit short-sighted of the government because it really wouldn't cost much to keep South Bay going. It would probably cost a lot less than keeping the warehouse going. Yeah, well, they got a big fat, uh, if you to believe the reporting, um, um, subsidy for wages of uh, tens and tens of millions of dollars. So, you know, um, and also you've got to, if you're the government or the political parties making the, these decisions, you don't want to fall out of favour too much with the, the regions. They don't want to be perceiving that you really don't care about them. Yeah, yeah. And I'm pretty sure some uh, sound there will, will, will be, I mean, it, it makes sense to look after them. And I'm pretty sure um good sense will prevail and 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 they'll get something it's not like they're a virgin which a virgin australia mm -hmm. which would be a complete waste of money because they do provide a service which people find useful and i'm pretty sure if the government needs to get to those far flung little towns in new zealand they've been flying sounds at flying sounds air right yeah uh, yeah or air chatham so uh, i think they fly yeah. they have plenty and stuff like that so we'll see what uh, happens there i was just thinking when you're talking about the a321 um, Neo and the extended range versions as well. I saw a picture the, a few days ago of some of the Delta fleet on the ground at uh, Victorville. I think they've parked up the seven fives there, dozens and dozens of them. They're not going to come back in, but some of their capacity will still be required if it bubbles back. I reckon Airbus are into such an incredible position for A321 Neo. Uh, and uh, the long-range version of that uh, Neo as well. Um, once things start back up again, they're in the box seat. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. I think you know production numbers will go down for Airbus as they will for all major airline producers. Well, the other one, um, but I think that, 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 although their production numbers go down, that A321 will will rocket ahead and will become the de facto replacement for. Um, yeah, obviously 757s, but it'll just become this, the, the go-to plane now, I think. It'll replace 75s. Um, it'll replace yeah. um, 737s seven, seven, and 8s. Um, yeah. You know, there, there are potentially thousands, a couple of thousand at least uh, potential there, I would have thought, as things start to ramp back up. And it'll replace the Xs as the cancellations start ramping up. I mean, it's coming, it's over 200 cancellations now. So I mean, you can so... almost make an argument for those carriers Legacy carriers mainly in America because they still have big, they have reasonably large fleets. But even you could even almost put it up as a uh, seven six seven long range replacement. Okay, it's got slightly fewer seats, but you know you can sort of you can maintain a, a close operation to what you already had for way less, way less. Yes, yes, no, no, you you, you can. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Airbus is is sitting in the box seat, although their numbers will go down. Yeah. They, they have the right plane for the time. So especially now that Boeing said it's going to go back to the drawing board on the NMA, middle of the market aircraft, um, they don't think that'll be flying before 2030. Um, the, the 737X cancellations are ramping up. It's interesting because now it's been a year that thing hasn't flown. There's all sorts of exit clauses in the various agreements they struck with the airlines. And the airlines don't want them. They don't need them. No. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, let's say Virgin Australia goes under. What's that, about 80 or 100 737 700s and 800s suddenly available for virtually nothing? And they had 28 Xs on order, 8 Xs or 9 Xs. They had them on order. Maxes or whatever they're called. Maxes, sorry, Maxes. So, so yeah, so that's another 28 or 25 that are going to get cancelled. And now, interestingly, at the other end of the spectrum, um, Cathay Pacific look like they're going to cancel their 21, is it? 21 or 25, Xs. 7, 9, 9 Xs. They, yeah, they're yeah. on the way out. And that whole program now, given the um, added scrutiny there's going to be of all these grandfathering rules, that whole program, it's got to be in doubt. I, you know, I don't think Emirates is going to be looking to adding a lot of capacity any of these airlines at the moment. Um, yeah, well, on the other hand, you know, it might give Boeing the breathing room they need to get through the, 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 the regulatory hurdles that they, they, they're going to have to jump to get that plane certified. So, you know, maybe they'll defer their orders for a while, but you'll see if, 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 if air travel doesn't pick up, there's going to be cancellations across the board on that. 
Um, so Boeing's going to come out of it a very different company. Airbus will come out of it a slightly different company, but because they appear to have the winning product at the moment, um, it's, it's going to be less traumatic for them. You might see a big spike um, or, or like a, um, the market suddenly jump into action of um, uh, 777-300ER freighter conversions because there could be quite yeah. a few passenger jets. And no one's actually tried that yet, have they? They haven't tried the Those things lift a lot of weight. Apparently there is a there is a triple seven conversion underway, but it's not sanctioned by Boeing. I, I read something about that that it it, it is it is happening. I mean, Boeing haven't wanted to do it because they wanted to sell their freighter version. But I think that is Rayleigh really companies having a crack at a triple seven freighter conversion. Um, the the just the sheer numbers of them available though might, might mean that, that you know they're easy to get. They're re- relatively cheap considering what they can do. And um, yeah, they have great range, and I mean, be, be like the um, uh, conversions of the um, uh, 747 passenger, 400 passenger planes to cargo. That was quite a market for a while. There's quite quite a yeah. few. Converts. Another interesting number that's just come out. I read it this week. Is that 747 passenger um, aircraft has dropped below 100? Wow. So there's less. Only 100 yeah. left. No, it's much less. I think it's like oh. 76. 747 passengers. So it, it went from over 100 down to 76, like almost instantly. Wow. Yeah. 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 Though one gets and, the feeling, and, was, and, and, and it's, it's an interesting thing to see, uh, that the uh, 747-8 uh, passenger, the I, um, that looks like it's going to have quite a long life. And you're seeing that the A380s, uh, A380, A380s, before this whole thing happened, airlines that had uh, two in the fleet, they were tending to want to park up their A380s before their 7478s. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, the A380s are probably a bit older than the 7478, I suppose. And I, I mean, they always say, oh, we can never fill them. And, and my, my sort of um, looking as an outsider looking in, I've always thought, well, you've never tried to fill them. Because, no. you know, uh, Korean Airlines was flying their um, A380s with less seats than their 747-400. Yeah, crazy. It Don't understand sense. that. We've never figured that one out, actually. There's, um, there's another interesting thing that happened. This, well, another interesting thing, um, South African Airlines is closed. That's it. Oh, yes. Yes, I saw that. I, I, and I wanted to, yeah, to hear what you thought about that. They're done, aren't they? Done, done, done. Boy, that took done, a long that, time. <laughs> it took a long time, but, it, but it, it all started, I think it all started about 12, 15 years ago when, they got a new CEO, an American guy, who, um, and they were in the process of renewing their fleet, and they had commitments for a whole lot of Airbus products, A320s, this, that, and the other. And this American guy came and cancelled all those contracts and started ordering 737-800. Uh, and, and cost them millions, you know, hundreds of millions. And then, you know, that didn't work, so they fired him. But then they were stuck with a sort of bits of fleet of this, that, and the other. And um, he went off and worked for Boeing, I believe. So <laughs> oh, no okay. surprises there. It was a plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was a, such, such a proud history, you know. It's one of those typical legacy uh, flag carrier sort of stories. And, you know, it, you look back at all those um, old images, you know, the, goes back decades, uh, all the main aircraft types all the way through, um, got the 747 early, um, SPs, you know, yeah. a great history. Um, Ethiopian must be the logical um, carrier to fill the gap. Well, Ethiopian will step up um, to some extent, and, and, and they have. I mean, Ethiopian's been quite competitive in, in, in that market, especially if you want to get people um, north to Ethiopia, then east or west across the continent. But, but um, South Africa has some quite healthy competition already. They have um, two other airlines. And they'll be fine. Um, the bilateral agreements will make it, it will take a while for them to get to the um, African network that, that, that SAA has. But apparently the South African government has already stepped up and said, come on, okay, we are going to make sure we can get these bilateral agreements in place as soon as possible to apply to these other airlines. So they've been quite realistic about it. I mean, they the long haul connections, though. Um, but they had the logical long range so, would be Ethiopian for South so, Africa, though, wouldn't it? Most South Africans fly BA, well, not most, a lot fly, used to fly SAA, but BA, Virgin, Lufthansa, Swissair, they all fly there. Um, um, Emirates is a very popular 
um, right. um, way to get there. there. There's no shortage in South Africa, and 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 SAA was you know it, it was the flag the, the flag carrier, but it probably wasn't the major carrier in terms of um, numbers to and fro South Africa. No, if you you look at photos of um, the main airport there, it's kind of crazy how many airlines fly into that place. Okay, it's, it is, and how often they fly. You know, BA's I think BA's got four flights a day. Wow. Um, yeah. I, um, in the US, they touched on it before, a huge bailout uh, for the economy there. Included in that, I think, is what, some $60 billion for airlines, the legacy carriers mainly. Um, Trump's been pretty uh, vocal about um, saying that if none of this money, if it's used, can go towards share buybacks. Um, yeah. And that seems to have been maybe, or uh, well, that's an explanation as to why that resilience, that cash resilience just isn't there. The money is spent, um, uh, the rainy day money seems to be spent on things like share buybacks to keep the share price beyond a certain level to, I presume, hit targets for bonuses. Uh, am I being too yeah. cynical? No, that's exactly, that's exactly what they've done. And that's exactly what's killed Boeing, is a constant share uh, 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 trying to jack the share price up so they met KPIs so they'd get their bonuses. And, yeah. um, and when everything's coming all, along, no problem. You can keep that ball in the air, those balls in the air. But. Yeah. The moment it stops, fun and games are all over. And then, and then the, the, you know, the poor guys have to, they get, you know, they lose their jobs and, and only get 40 million. I mean, where's the justice? <laughs> it's tough, man. Um, you make a good point, though, because uh, part of the virtue signalling, for, for one of a better description of um, uh, the, from politicians during this uh, COVID nineteen crisis, is some of them are taking reductions in their pay. Yeah, probably the same in Australia. And uh, I see a lot of the feedback. It's like good on them. You know, it's it's a well received thing, and and you know, good on them because they're being seen to be um, doing their bit. But when you find out how much these people are paid and you see what that proportion is of their income and how much they're going to be out of pocket, um, it's pretty hard for the average working person to feel too much too much adoration towards them. You know, they might be taking a, a $50,000 hit on their $470,000 salary. So, um, uh, well, and, I, don't think, I don't think anyone's going that far. I think, yeah, they're offering like... <laughs> well, no, they're talking 20%, 10% reductions here. Um, the ones that uh, make me laugh are the ones who say, I'll donate it to charity. Well, that doesn't help the rate payer, does it? <laughs> no. no. Well, you don't, want to, you don't want to let the rate payers off the leash because they might recognise it's all a scam if you can do that. So that's a lot. So you've got, to, you've got to try and convince the rate payers that it's every cent they give is vital to the smooth running of their city. Because why shouldn't a small town CEO be on about, I don't know, 350 to 500K? Well, that's why they these deserve guys, it. These guys could be running New York City, right? It's, yeah, it's and no they're headhunted. If, if you don't constantly. pay any attention to them for one moment, they'll be instantly headhunted by one I'll of the top companies hunting. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you've got to watch yourself. It's like these, these university chancellors, mate. I mean, if you didn't offer them one and a half million a year, they'd be gone. <laughs> yeah, because they're in such demand. And, you know, overseas somewhere, wherever that is, they're paying three times as much, right? No. Well, uh, well, except, except they're not. Yeah, that's yeah. the interesting no. thing. Yeah. They, could, they could be off running Oxford on a third of that. Oh, hang on. <laughs> no, I'll stay in Sydney. Um, yeah. the, the elephant in the room with all of this, we haven't directly touched on it, but we might as well because we kind of discussed it last time and, and, it, and it's affecting everything that we're talking about is affected, is the response to this, um, this pandemic. And I've been trying to get a range of views. I note that Peter Hitchens, who's, I think, um, a well-known columnist in the UK, is saying that this is a complete overreaction. The, um, the uh, cure is, worth, uh, is worse than the disease and that we're being run by teenagers. Well, he's referring to the UK, um, though I guess there are similar actions being taken, uh, UK government, Australian government, New Zealand government. There, I must say the impression uh, from over this side of the Tasman is that Australia hasn't been as forceful in their um, no. uh, response to it as maybe New Zealand. We've gone to this level four very quickly, which is very restrictive. But there is going to be damage. All the um, uh, reputable forecasting groups are predicting uh, a, a lot of unemployment and near depression um, 
conditions. I don't know if it'll get that bad. I'm not an economist. But uh, given that uh, in this country we've had, I think, uh, 12 deaths, so I think we're up to a billion dollars per person there, um, that we've had 14 or 1,500 cases, um, uh, two-thirds of them have recovered without any problem. I'm not downplaying um, what it can do to individual people, but the uh, response has been huge. Now, I'm not an epidemiologist or an economist, so you, you can only go on the information that you're receiving. But, you know, I think you could make an argument for possibly the, for an overreaction here. I wonder what you're thinking. I think, I think you've lost your mind, Paul. Um, I, 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 <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Australia, I think they, 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 they're coming up to chucking um, certainly 130 billion for the first tranche. Um, I think by the time they've, they've, um, the dust will have settled, they're talking at well over 200 million. Um, they've lost, I think, 70 people. So they, 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 they've taken it far more seriously than New Zealand in terms of um, throwing money at it. Um, I, I worry about the flu season because we're obviously going to have to shut down then because um, that's, that's... And the road gonna toll. Cost, that's going to cost a lot more people. I, 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 I mean, obviously, Australia and New Zealand have been exceptionally lucky. I, I, I mean, that's the only way you can describe it because, you know, countries like England, Italy, you know, or UK, Italy, Spain, they, they have lost a lot of people, a lot of people. The USA... They're going to have over 800,000 cases by tomorrow. They are losing people at over 2,000 a day. So they're probably going to lose 50,000, 60,000 at least before the, turner is, before the, turner, before the corner is turned. Um, I mean, maybe there is something to be said for sparsely populated countries with a lot of a relative large amount of sunshine and fresh air because the, the numbers, when, and I'm sure most of the people watching this, all of them, both of them, will have see, looked at the Worldometer, Worldometer um, website where you can see the, the number of cases per million of population, number of deaths per million of population, uh, number of infections per million, blah, 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 blah. Australia is running at a lower rate of infection per million of population than New Zealand, has lost slightly more people, um, three per million as opposed to two per million. Um, and the infection rates never really got that high. So I, I just really, really lucky because if you'd applied the same numbers um, to Australia and New Zealand that the UK did get, or Italy did get, it would, it would have been a lot more serious. Now, I don't think, I, I, I don't think that's um, due to, I think it's more due to the, the accident of demographics and the way the country works than I do, than I do um, think it's got anything to do with the measures taken. So I'm going to have to move my phone because it's getting too hot in the sun. Yeah. And Paul, to draw this to a close, my battery's just about to run out. Okay. Well, I think we've had a pretty good discussion. Um, we've been going for a bit. Um, yeah, that's a nice scene. Um, hang on for as long as you can. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Well, okay. Uh, um, I just wonder what the political fallout will be if it turns out in a few months from now or a year from now uh, and uh, people are looking back and they're going, my God. How come we, we, we took all that uh, for this? And that could be um, a, a 180 degree um, sentiment, you know, flip that could be hitting the politicians dealing with this today. I guess they're mindful of that. They, they, they are going to be mindful of it. And, and there's going to be a lot of um, sort of um, patting, self congratulatory, self patting on the back to say how they avoided an absolute disaster. But I mean, and like you, I'm not an economist. In fact, I don't know anyone who is really an economist, and I'm certainly not someone who knows anything about epi epidemics. But, you know, considering that Australia has done very little in terms of shutdown, or certainly Queensland, um, and considering that uh, New Zealand's like tamped down completely, and they both have similar numbers of cases and very similar numbers of death rates, and they're both very, very low, um, you do have to think it's an accident of geography and demographics that, that, that's made it easier for us than it is for anything else. Because, uh, I mean, I'm really, I can't emphasize this enough. Queensland has done essentially nothing. <laughs> okay. I, all the shops are I was open. waiting all for a big announcement. <laughs> no, I, I, I can, you, all the shops are open. You can walk down the high street. You can go clothes shopping. You can go, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. 
All right. Okay. Well, obviously the um, a- animals still need to be fed, so uh, that doesn't go away, they, right? They do. They do. And my phone needs to be charged. All right. And uh, so uh, this is interesting using Zoom. Um, it's it's great seeing where you are. I don't know if my um, surroundings are so wonderful. Certainly not uh, living the Aussie dream like you. Uh, so we'll perhaps try this one again, this uh, format again for the next podcast. In the meantime, I'm signing off from my little studio in, in locked down Auckland. Um, Martin, meanwhile, you're roaming on the range. Roaming in Roma, not locked down. All good. Roaming in Roma. I love it. Okay, so it's goodbye yeah. from me and... See you later. <laughs>